And our scripture reading for today will be 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 through 18, which can be found on page 990 of the Blue Bibles. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good to be with you this, this uh, morning. Uh, I must apologize at the outset. I am a bit congested, so you'll have to bear with me a bit. Uh, well, today we are approaching the last few verses of the uh, letter, uh, the second letter to the Thessalonians. And uh, it's a privilege to open up this letter with you and, and wrap up our time uh, in this book together. So as we get started today, let me ask you a question. Who's the laziest person that you know? I know everyone probably had someone that just popped into their mind, uh, maybe as a lazy coworker or a lazy sibling or who knows, maybe a lazy spouse. I don't, not, not, nothing like that's at my house, but uh, I'll say that I've been accused of being lazy more than once. Uh, well, there's a great poem uh, by the great poet Shel Silverstein that articulates laziness well. It's called Lazy Jane, and if you know Shel Silverstein, he accompanies his poems with pictures. And in this poem, there's a picture of a young girl who's laying down with her mouth open to the sky. The poem goes like this. Lazy, 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 lazy Jane. She wants a drink of water, so she waits and waits and waits and waits for it to rain. Lazy people want things, but they don't want to have to do anything for them. Well, let me ask you a little bit more of a serious question. When you think about the things that threaten our community, what, the things that could cause this community to fall apart, what comes to mind? You know, us as a, a small church on the north side of the city, you know, who knows, cultural isolation, persecution, financial crisis that could really pull us apart. But would you be surprised that on that list of things that could threaten our little community, that laziness would be on that list? Laziness is something that threatens a small community like us. Well, today as we wrap up this letter we are looking at a command, a few commands that Paul gives the church. And what he's doing is he's praying for them. He's encouraging them in this letter, exhorting them, teaching them, so that they might be strengthened to face the persecution that they face. But now here in these closing few verses, he begins to turn his attention away from the external threats that face this community, and he begins to address some of the internal threats that put this community in jeopardy. So today, as he uh, encourages them and instructs them, he gives us four commands and a promise related to the peace of the community. So we'll walk through the passage together, but before we do that, let me uh, ask God for his help. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there is no doubt that you are the one who has created this community. You've saved us. You've redeemed us. You're the one who is sanctifying us. So as we, this morning, gather in this room to worship you, we realize that this is the community that's created by you and sustained by you. 
And so, Father, as we open up this text, we ask, Lord, that you would, you would knit us together, strengthen us. We pray, Father, that through this text, you might instruct us, shape us, warn us, and encourage us. Father, it's for your glory that we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Elon Musk, it's a wealthy guy who owns a company called SpaceX, and in this company that he owns, SpaceX, has some pretty ambitious goals. They want to send people into space, and they want to eventually send people to Mars. So they're currently building a, a new launch pad in Texas. And there at the launch pad, they've put this, I think, a prototype of the new rocket that they're going to use to send people into space. Supposedly, this new rocket is capable of more than twice the 7.5 million pound thrust of NASA's legendary Saturn V moon rocket. It's made of stainless steel. It's fascinating that something so strong, so powerful, is also quite fragile. A, a loose tile, a wrongly placed wire, a, a, some kind of a loose a, a bolt could destroy the entire rocket. In a simil similar way, I think about the church. We, we are a powerful entity. Christ himself taught us that the church is so strong that it will push back against the gates of hell. And yet, as we experience the church often, it feels like we are weak, that we are fragile. I think that that disparity sometimes is we are a powerful entity and yet we sometimes feel so weak and fragile is because God wants us to be diligent, trusting him, relying on him for all that we need, knowing that he's the one who protects us and sustains us. The church in Thessalonica is a growing church, a young church. And so it needs some instructions. It needs to be reminded to watch out for the things that could threaten their young community. But they also need the encouragement to know that it is the Lord who provides and protects them and is the one who will ultimately provide the peace of their community. So as we approach our text today, I just want to look quickly back at the verses that uh, come right before what we just had read. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 3. If you don't mind, turn there and look, look at these opening verses. It says in verse 4, Paul says, And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul has been speaking very encouragingly to this church. He has great love for them. And he says, we have great confidence in the Lord that you are going to keep doing what you've been commanded to do. So as he reminds them of his confidence in them, he now turns his attention to remind them a few of the commandments, a few of the instructions, imperatives that the church needs to abide by. If you let your eyes scan over the text that we had just read a few moments ago, you'll see that the word command reappears three more times in our text. Verse 6, verse 10, verse 12, and then also in verse 13. Paul doesn't explicitly use the word command, but we find again a fourth and final command. And what do these commands have to do? What are they all about? Well, Paul here at the end of this letter is instructing them about things that they can do to help protect the peace of their community, their young and growing community. Yet he also leaves us in the final verses of our passage with a promise, a promise that it's God who is the one who will provide the peace that we need. So I want to walk us through the passage by looking at those four commandments and then that final promise. Look at verse 6 with me. This is the first time in our passage that the word command is, appears. And this is what it says. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the traditions that you received from us. Here, Paul emphasizes the imperative that he's giving them by saying, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, a messenger comes and may have an announcement, but those who are to receive the announcement or the instructions may dismiss it because, well, that's just the messenger speaking. But here, Paul is reminding them that he isn't just a simple messenger coming to speak of some wisdom that he's come up with. No, he is speaking with the authority of his king, the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the instruction he gives? Well, it's pretty simple. He says, keep away from anyone who walks in idleness. To put it another way, watch out for lazy people. Watch out for those who aren't walking according to the traditions that you have learned from us. 
The word idle, what comes to mind? I, for me, when I think of the word idle, I think of a car that's idling. It's not going anywhere. It's not moving forward. It's just sitting there. The word idle also carries with it the connotation of being disorderly or unproductive. Paul says to avoid those people who are walking in idleness and not in accord with the traditions. Translators have, have tried to wrestle with how to translate this word idle, and sometimes they think maybe it should be translated disobedient, those who are disobedient or those who are disorderly, but we kind of begin to see that later on in the passage, Paul is really talking about those who are, who are just unwilling to work, the, those who are lazy in their community. He says, watch out for those folks. Avoid them. They'll lead you astray. Readers of this, uh, of this passage have wrestled with, why, why does Paul need to even give this instruction? Why does he have to remind this young church to watch out for lazy people? Seems kind of obvious, but they've begun to piece together some of the context, some of the, the backdrop for the necessity of this commandment. Some have said that the reason for him needing to write this instruction was because a few of the people in the community had begun to have a false understanding about the last days. They began to believe that the day of the Lord, his return, had either already happened or was so imminent that there's no reason to work. So they just stopped. Others have tried to paint a backdrop to understand why he needed to write this by looking at the city of Thessalonica. And they saw an issue, of, uh, a problem within this city. It was a problem of patronage. The idea that some people who had influence and power took advantage of others by forcing them to pay them so that they wouldn't have to work. So either way, Paul says, either are this kind of wrong views of the end times, forcing them into not working, or maybe this idea of patronage, taking advantage of others that's leading them to not work. Either way, not working is really not an option for a godly life, a life that seeks to be faithful. So he commands them, watch out for these people who aren't walking in a godly way. Look at how his logic continues. He explains why it's so dangerous to hang out with lazy people. Verse 7 reads, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did, do not have the right, but to give you our, in ourselves an example to imitate. Paul is in calling them to remember how he lived among them while he was there. He says, look, we, we had the right to ask you for help to, to, to uh, provide food and money for us because we were trying to, to preach to you, but we chose not to take that because we wanted to give you an example. An example of a godly life is a, an example of working hard. Paul warns these people that if you let people in your community walk in idleness, they might lead the community astray. They might actually lead them into uh, walking away from the faith itself. So let me try to actually bring this applicable for us today. You see, if we as a church, a young church, begin to allow people to persist in our midst to our lazy, we'll begin to actually uh, contradict ourselves. You see, Jesus, he came and he lived a life that was selfless, not selfish. He didn't come to take advantage of others, but rather he came to serve. And so if the church is made up of people who are just lazy, who are selfish, well, Others who are around us who see the church will just dismiss us because we aren't living out what we preach, what we share, the message we teach. But actually, what's even more dangerous about allowing lazy people to persist in our community is that it actually threatens us, actually could actually lead us astray. Community has a transformative power to it. The people you hang out with influence you. At our office, at uh, the church office, recently a few of my coworkers uh, bought AirPods, or as I like to call them, EarPods, the Apple headphones. And I saw them using them. They talked about how helpful they were. They, they seemed really cool when they were wearing them. And they were really beginning to tell me about, oh, man, you should really get some of these ear, ear, uh, AirPods. Uh, and I began to be influenced by them. And so I eventually went out and I bought some. And I haven't regretted it. But... <laughs> The fact is, the people you hang out with, the people you spend time with, the people you associate with, they have an influence on you. They change the way you think about the world around you. They think they shape 
what you believe to be true. They shape your desires. They shape who you become. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who are we hanging out with? Who are the people we're associating with? Are they people who are helping us, leading us along to an accord according to the words of God, or are they people who are maybe leading us astray? If we allow people, lazy people, to persist in our midst, it, it, it puts our community, the peace of our community, in, in jeopardy. So that's the first commandment that Paul gives is, hey, as if you want to do something about protecting the peace of your community, watch out for those who walk in idleness. But Paul gives a second command. And if I could summarize it, I'd summarize it in this way. Pull your own weight. The peace of our church relies heavily on all of us pulling our own weight. Look at verses 10 and 11 where this uh, command appears. Verse 10 reads, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Let me begin here by actually explaining what Paul's not saying. When he says this instruction, if anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. What he's not saying here is that those who are sick, those who are elderly, those who are unable to work, we shouldn't just let them Uh, go without being provided for. No, what he's talking about here, he's talking about people who are just lazy, unwilling to work, people who aren't willing to roll up their sleeves and and be busy at work. He says, those people, they, they shouldn't be allowed to eat. They shouldn't be provided for. Some of you have read The Hunger Games, it's a, a series, a book that follows this uh, story about a, gr- a group of people that live in what's called District 1. And these people have begun to believe that the good life is a life where they don't have to work. They take advantage of others. They exploit and, and take advantage of people who live in other districts. They spend their days being busybodies. They think that, again, the good life is a life that just has to avoid any actual hard work. The story traces the collapse of their so-called paradise. You and I today, we, I think, have come to believe at times that the good life is a life that is any life that is void of any work, of any hard work. Now, before you dismiss this warning, this second warning about pulling your weight, because you look at your schedule and you're like, man, my schedule is full. I am busy at work all the time. Let Let me just ask you a couple questions about what you think about rest. Think for a moment about how we are conditioned to work really hard during the week so that we can rest on the weekends by not doing anything. Or think about how we think about retirement. It's kind of the end goal of our careers that we might be able to retire and not have anything to do and no work to have to deal with. Think about the activities that we're told are restful. Mindlessly consuming Netflix for hours is so-called restful or consuming social media is so-called restful. But every time we finish doing those things, we aren't ever really that restful. I think it's covertly or not so covertly communicated to us in our culture that, that resting is ceasing from any actual activity, any work that demands anything of us. Paul's command here is that you got to watch out that you aren't falling into the false idea that the good life is a life that is void of any work. Our hearts long for rest. Rest is a good thing. We spoke about it this morning in uh, the this morning's uh, bio, or, uh, Sunday school class downstairs. We talked about how rest is something that's good and restorative. And yet the world tells us, the story the world tells us is a story that the way that you can rest is not by, by being someone who contributes, but by being a consumer. Consuming Netflix, consuming social media, consuming experiences. Yet the church stands in contrast to all of this and offers a peace that is far greater, far better, far more satisfying, a peace that can be found in Christ. But I also believe that each of us, we have a longing. We have a longing to be fruitful and productive. That is a good longing that each of us have. Yet our culture tries to mute that longing inside of each of us, telling us that work is something terrible and an inevitable evil that must be avoided. Don't let that longing to be fruitful and productive be corrupted, for a godly life is a fruitful life. 
So let me stress this importance of this command by, again, applying it to our church community. Our church community, it's in jeopardy if all we have is a bunch of spectators and no one willing to actually roll up their sleeves and work. Paul here is writing, warning them that if you let people persist in your midst who are lazy, acting as leeches, benefiting from others, well, what happens is that the peace of your community is going to fall apart. Some will, will fall into patterns of ungodly living. Others will wear out. Others will grow bitter. And so he instructs them that if you want to do something about protecting the peace of your community, he says to the church in Thessalonica, he says, pull your own weight, work hard. So to us here in our church, as we think about what is it that we can do to protect the peace of our community, well, it means pulling up your sleeves and working hard, not succumbing to this false idea that the good life is a life void of any work. The first command Paul gives us is, is that we should avoid associating with those who will lead us astray. Second one is to pull our own weight, but a third instruction, a third way that we can help protect the, the, the peace of our community is by aspiring to work quietly. Look at verse 12 where this appears. Verse 12, Paul writes, Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Here, f first notice that there's some similarities between uh, what he just wrote here in verse 12 and the first commandment. He, he says that he gives this command in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, once again reminding us that he's speaking here not out of just you know, some great you know, advice, but rather he's stressing the importance, how critical these commands are to the peace of their community. Picture for a moment how this would have first been heard by the community. Here in verse 12, he's, he says that now such persons, those persons who are walking in idleness. In verse 12, he's addressing those in the community who are walking in idleness. Yet, this, the letter would have been read to the whole community. It would have arrived and someone would have taken it and the community would have gathered and it would have been read out loud to them all. So for starters, those who are walking in idleness probably felt the shame of their wrong living. But you see, everyone in the community would have heard their, this command, this, this instruction to live, to aspire to live uh, and work quietly. These words echo back to the instructions Paul gave this church earlier in his first letter. If you have your Bible, flip back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It should just be uh, one page back. In his first letter to this church, he wrote them, and again, encouraging them, instructing them. And in the midst of a portion where he's, he's encouraging them to continue to love one another, he writes this. This is verse 11 of chapter 4. He tells them to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. These verses, the verse 11, is sometimes read at the funeral of godly people to describe their life. It's incredible that at the end of a faithful life, these words might be read, that they aspired to live a quiet life and to work with their hands. It was pretty crazy this week. I was working on this part of the sermon, this part of the text, and uh, being kind of stuck in a moment of, uh, of writer's block, I decided to pull out my phone and started scrolling through social media, of course, being distracted. And I happened to, to, to find an artist on Instagram, and I clicked on their, uh, their bio, and in their little bio, the words read to describe who this person was, that they aspired to live quietly and to work with their hands. I was like, this is crazy. I was just being distracted by my social media, but it was maybe a sign I should have gotten back to my work. But the fact was, I love the fact that this person, this artist on, on her social media to describe her life, that she said she aspired to live quietly and to work with her hands. That was definitely nothing, something, I, that wouldn't be something I would write in a bio on my social media. Yet maybe it should be. Here, Paul is instructing them that, that these words are, are, are describing a godly life, a life that's willing to work in the behind the scenes, uh, to work quietly and to work with their own hands, minding their own business, not being busy bodies. Question for you. 
Would you be satisfied if at the end of your life these were the words that were read to describe your life? This passage I was thinking a little bit about and I thought about a stage production and how oftentimes I know myself, I, I, I want to be the one who gets all the limelight, the one on stage with the spotlight on them and gets all the recognition. But what about those people who are behind the scenes, who are the ones who are raising the curtain, the ones who are helping to set the lights, those who are getting the props ready? They're just as important to the production as anyone else. So as I think about our church, again, our community here, why is this a threat that people wouldn't aspire to live quiet lives? Why would that be a threat to our community? Well, if our church is full of people who are just craving the limelight, people who want the spotlight, well, nothing will get done. Nothing will move forward. So Paul instructs them, says, hey, aspire to live a quiet life. Know that a good life, a godly life, is a life that could be lived behind the scenes, working hard, being faithful with what has been given to them. Well, we've seen now three of the instructions Paul gives, and we come now to the fourth and final one. Here in verse 13, we don't see the word uh, command, but here we have the fourth and final command. Look at it with me. It says, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. The command here he's giving them is keep keep going. Don't swerve from doing good. Press on. Don't let others stop you from doing good. He says if anyone isn't doing what's been commanded, take note of that person. Avoid them. Keep on the path that you are on. It's far better that they might experience, uh, uh, as he's speaking to those who were in the midst and would have heard this instruction, he says, those, who, those of you who are living an ungodly, disobedient, lazy life, well, it's far better that you experience shame in this moment of hearing this instruction rather than persist in living the way you are. Rather, a godly life is a life that persists and perseveres. Being a part of a young and growing church is really exciting. Many of you have probably have experienced this, that being here at Holy Trinity, there's sometimes there's seasons that are just really fun to be a part of. Yet, we all know that if we, pers- if we keep hanging around for too long, this community, well, it's going to face persecution. It's going to go through trials and tribulations. It's going to be difficult. We're going to go through seasons of, of doubt and apathy. And yet, we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be sidelined? Are we going to let ourselves grow tired and simply give up on what we've been called to do. A few weeks ago, I I woke up and I took my son for a quick little walk through our neighborhood, and I happened to stumble upon the starting line of the Bucktown 5K. Uh, And the music was playing loud. There was crowds beginning to form. People were coming outside of their homes to cheer on the runners. And there was just such excitement and energy that I felt like I just wanted to jump in and do the race as well. But my better judgment took over and realized I was not prepared to run a 5K. But I realized just joining with those on the sideline who are cheering on the racers, there's something energetic about it. Here, these words that Paul gives us in, in verse 13, these words that keep going, don't grow weary in doing good, they're like the spectators at a race cheering on the runners. I spoke with some friends who ran the Chicago Marathon. I said, why would you put yourself through such excruciating pain? And they said, well, when you're out there and you're on the track running, there's something invigorating, something strengthening about hearing people cheer you on. And so here, Paul's voice echoes down through the centuries, rooting us on, telling us to keep going. Don't get tired or distracted. You're doing great. Keep it up. Let me make one more point of application here. You and I as a church, we have a role to play for one another, to be that voice of encouragement to each other, to keep spurring one another on. What does this look like? Well, it means going and being a part of a community group where you can speak words of encouragement over others and where you can receive words of encouragement. It means showing up here on Sunday mornings and and energetically and excitedly joining in with the worship music because we're not only singing those songs to the Lord, but we're singing them to strengthen one another. That as we gather here and we sing with energy, we're actually strengthening one another. So let's not grow tired of doing good. 
four instructions for us today as we think about how we can protect the peace and strengthen our church. Watch out for those who are walking in idleness. Pull your own weight. Work and aspire to work quietly. Press on, persevere, keep going. But here we approach the final verses of this letter to the church in verses 16 and 18. And here we receive a promise, a promise that should motivate us and help us on this, of the, as we go about this work of keeping the peace of our community. Look at verse 16 through 18 with me. Here Paul finishes by writing, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way, that the Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuine, genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Here in these final verses, this promise comes in the form of a blessing. You might maybe hear some overtones of, of a similar blessing that we find in Scripture, earlier, much earlier in Scripture, where Moses gives a blessing to Aaron in number 6. Moses spoke over Aaron. He said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Here, Paul is writing this blessing, speaking a blessing over the church, but in doing so, he's reminding them of a great promise, a promise that it is God who is the one who is the provider of peace. He is the Lord of peace. I just love the phrase here. May the Lord of peace give you peace in every way and at all times. It's an incredible uh, idea that whether whatever part of the day, morning or evening, whether it's a season of of discouragement or a season of encouragement, may it be the Lord of peace who provides you your own peace. Here we come across uh, what I think is kind of an interesting little bracket. Look actually at the, the verses that precede these instructions, the four instructions that we just looked at. Look at verses, excuse me, three of chapter three. Right here he says, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul brackets, I believe, these four commandments he gives at the, at the end of this letter with this reminder that it's God who's the one who is faithful. He will establish you. He is the one who will guard you against the evil one. May it be the Lord who directs your heart to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. May he be the one who provides the peace that you so long for. The reason this promise at the end of the letter is so important right here on the heels of these commandments is because sometimes we, we, we hear instructions, we hear commands that we're supposed to follow through on, and we may, we may do a few things to work towards those, uh, that goal. We may do a few of these instructions, but then things will get hard. Things will become difficult, and we'll give up on trying to press on. And the reason for that is that sometimes you and I, we, we don't always believe that the goal is actually achievable. I'll finish with this quick story. I, when I was young, probably first or second grade, decided that I was going to break the world record for the longest bike ride. Somehow I got this idea in my head that I could do it, and so I went to bed early one, one night, and I got up bright and early the next day, got on my bike, and being that I was only in first or second grade, I couldn't cross the street. So I just, all I could do was go around my block time and time and time again. Though, sadly, the day I chose to set this world record, I woke up on a day that it was rainy and cold, and so I maybe did a few laps, probably didn't even ride my bike for more than an hour, and decided to give up. The reason I gave up on this big dream I had was because no one had actually told me that I could do that. I hadn't done any preparation. I didn't have what I needed to, to actually accomplish that, that goal of mine. And so it was easy to give up on. But you see, when we are given instructions, when we're given a goal, something to work towards, something hard before us, there's something about knowing that what we're called to do is actually something that can be accomplished. So as Paul gives us these instructions to work, work hard, Work hard to keep the peace of your community. It's not something that he just tells you to do and says, good luck. But he gives us a promise to say, no, I'm going to be the one that ultimately provides you the peace that you need. The goal that he calls you to strive towards is a goal that he will be the one who makes sure is accomplishable. 
He is the one who will give peace to this community, to you, and to all who trust in the work of Christ. So today, as you hear these instructions, don't think I'm, in, I'm giving you some really difficult, hard things to do and say, good luck. No, we have a God who will go with us, who strengthens us. And it's by looking to Christ and his work on the cross that we can have confidence and, sh- and be assured that peace is possible. Experiencing peace as in community and internal peace as individuals is possible because of what Christ did for us on the cross. So let's Let's leave here today with that encouragement. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you that you are the giver of peace. You are the one who sustains us and protects us. And so, Father, we, we strive, Lord, to work hard, to be about the work that you've called us to. Lord, we do so not because we have some amazing strength of our own, but because, Lord, you're the one who gives us promises that we can trust. And so with the promise of peace today, we seek the peace of our homes. We seek, Lord, the peace of this church. And, Lord, we know that we can have personal peace with you because of what Christ did on the cross for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.